And so what we also see is that there isn't already an over-reliance on fracked gas in the Northeast. And there we have, and over and over and over again, we've seen increased barriers to being able to build more solar and wind and other alternative energies. So we wanted to hold this event in order to bring our community together, to come together online, in person, in this new hybrid world that we all embody, in order to discuss how this happened, to understand that a little bit more, to know what resources exist for folks who need support in order to afford this rate increase, and also to get to come together to brainstorm and strategize about what we can do next to fight these cost increases. So tonight we are joined by an incredible panel of experts and community leaders who are doing the work to ensure that people have exactly that, the right information to be able to make the most informed decisions. But first, we're going to start the night off with some stories from directly impacted community members who shared what these rate hikes have meant for them, how it has, has expressed itself in their own lives. We will then introduce the panel who will share a little bit about themselves and then share what they think is important for all of us to know based on the work that they do and the, what I like to do. The analogy I like to use is like what part of the elephant that they touch, because we all touch a different part of the elephant, or like elephant, um, and we all can, all the pieces of that, we all come together and we can figure out the best solutions for ourselves. And so once our panelists have a moment to share what they'd like to share with us, then we're going to break out into small groups, both here and in Zoom world. So our lovely moderators and facilitators in Zoom will be uh, breaking folks up into small breakout groups. And we'll have a chance to discuss and reflect on both on what we've heard in the stories, as uh, well as our own stories, how this has impacted you in your life, as well as then any questions that may have come up for you that you would like to ask our panelists. And so we'll take a few moments to do that. And then we'll come back together as a large group and we'll share those questions. We'll share some of those reflections. I'll invite members of the audience to come up um, and share what their table has come up with. Anyone who has specific questions for the panelists is welcome to do that. And then we will also then invite our Zoom um, participants as well. If any questions come up, we'll be sure to be um, forwarding those questions to our panelists as well. And then once that is done, we will uh, close out with a uh, some actions that people can take, some information that we want to make sure that you leave tonight with. And then we will close and we will talk about next steps and how we continue this work with us. So very quickly, just some quick housekeeping. Um, there for folks, just make sure if you have any needs for those who are here in, um, in person, we have supplies at each table as well as an information table right outside the door. We're all, if you have haven't had a chance to pick up some of the flyers and information, they are located there. Um, bathrooms are located right outside, and I believe to the left, anyone correct me if I'm wrong? Yes, to the right, excuse me, uh, right outside the door to the right if you need it. Um, and facilitators are in the room if you have any questions or get stuck or confused on anything, as well as in our Zoom room as well. So please feel free to put your, um, put your questions or concerns um, in the chat in our Zoom folks. Our Zoom moderators will be there for you. All right, so if there are no questions, everyone is ready to go. I'm going to go ahead and introduce um, Anne, who will be sharing some of the stories uh, from our community members. My name is Ann Brossi, and um, I have a story that is about a small business. Um, this is a business in downtown Manchester, and the owners are Paul Nault and his wife Ann Nault. And they have a restaurant. And I went into that talk to them because I know them, my daughter, uh, daughter in law's son know them. And I just said, you know, we were doing a town hall. We'd like to invite you as a small business if it's impacting you. He said he couldn't be here because this is their busiest time, dinner, um, dinner hour. But he said, please tell them that this is having a big impact on a small business. Um, he has two small businesses. The, the restaurant is brand new. 
And um, they are just in business about two years right now, and they're just about making it. It takes a while to get a restaurant going, but the electricity bill has doubled, he said. And it's having a big impact on this business that they're running. And he has another business which has been in business for uh, quite a few years, but he said the same thing is happening. It's having an impact because his bill has doubled. Um, I said to him, have you looked at other companies besides Eversource and Unitil? Because I have a different company and my bill has not gone up. So we had a conversation about that. But it's not just impacting individuals, it's impacting small businesses too. So we have some individual stories, I understand. Yes. <clears throat> I think we had someone on Zoom as well. Thank you so much, Anne. And so our next storyteller is going to be on Zoom. I invite Viola, who will share um, a story of a community member as well. Uh, hi, Grace, and hi, everyone in on Zoom and in person. Um, I have one of our leaders who is actually trying to join Zoom. She's going to share her story. So, Grace, is it okay if we get back to you? Uh, once she joins, she's having trouble right now. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you awesome. for letting us know. Thank you. We do also have Sebastian. Is has Sebastian there on Zoom to share his story? All right, family emergency. We are rolling with it in real time. Right, well, thank you all. So we will then toss the ball to Jennifer, who will share stories, and then we'll come back to uh, Viola. Hi everybody, thank you for joining us tonight. So I have here a story from Mark Lennon in New London, New Hampshire, who says, I am fortunate to have been able to disengage from Eversource. I live in an old house and own an old barn, both face south, both roofs are sheathed with solar panels. Eversource sends me a check once a year for the electricity they produce above and beyond what I use. I guess that makes me a beneficiary of any rate hike. I'm producing enough power now to trade in my propane hot water and space heater for electric on demand and be done with those bills as well. I'm not a wealthy person, but it all seems so straightforward. It's an investment in my long-term financial well-being and in a drop and in parentheses and a drop in the ocean sort of way in the well-being of the planet. Who in their right mind would act otherwise? Then I have another story, and this is from Pete Vanderland in Tamworth. And he says, my shop bill last month was over $150. These days, it's a fridge, a six-gallon hot water heater never used, a very small squirrel cage blower, around two amps on the furnace, and on hot days, I ran an exhaust fan 4.5 amps. That's it. The shop is turned off. That's the commercial account. The house is over $300. That's AC in one room of the house during the day, turned off at night. That's the residential increase you saw kick in in August. The state has assisted in this by claiming any building unattached to the main residence is to have a commercial meter. That allows for a myriad of add-ons, the worst being the 5,000 watts uninterrupted for one half hour charge, which come with a $9.75 penalty every time you use it. Since I run cooling ovens for glass, turning one on nicks me for that unless I do what the Eversource rep told me to do, turn it off at 20 minutes and restart it. I can't really run my little business at this point, so I'm lucky I have other income sources. Blame the PUC. <laughs> and sales has a story as well from somebody. Uh, hey there, sales with New Hampshire Movement. The story is from John McNally in Monroe, New Hampshire. Um, John says, Liberty Utilities of London, Air, New Hampshire, without advance notice, virtually doubled its rate as of August 1st, 2022, from about 11 cents a kilowatt hour to 20, 22 cents a kilowatt hour, saying that this new rate would stay in effect until January 31st, 2023. Liberty claims it's not applying any markup to this outrageous rate but rather is only passing through what is paying for electricity from an unidentified third party. He also received a heating oil delivery of 189 gallons on September 23rd, and the price was $4.47 a gallon. 
Um, he called the company and now it's five dollars and eighty three cents, an increase of thirty percent in only three weeks. In the same three period, crude oil prices were more or less the same. Uh, these price increases cannot be attributed to anything but corporate greed. They certainly do not reflect recent inflationary pressures, such as they are. Uh, I hope something can be done to roll back this greed. Thank you for your efforts and your concern, John McNally. Um, are the folks on Zoom ready to share? Back to Grace, maybe. Cool. Thank you so much, Sales and Jennifer and Han for that. And so we're just going to double check with our compatriots on Zoom. Viola, do we have our community member ready to go? Uh, Grace, uh, so I'm trying to connect um, our speaker for the night on phone because she's really wanting to share her story, but technical issues um, are coming up for her. So uh, as you can hear me, just bear with me for a second. And if I'm able to get her on the voice audio, she'll be able to share her story like in um, a few seconds. Thank you for being patient with me. Yeah, no, thank you. I know we all have to adapt to again, the Zoom world. So thank you all for sharing that. And I'm sure there are more stories that we'll hear throughout the night. And I'll, you know, I'll quickly share my own story, which is that I have Liberty, liberty Utilities um, and although my husband and I can afford the rate increase, it was it, the rate increase absolutely doubled for us as well. We went from you know, maybe $100, $150 a month to our um, the next bill was $300, um, about $350. And it was it was a, a deep, deep. It's definitely affecting all of us in different ways. And so I'll be waiting for our community member to join us and maybe we'll go ahead and pivot and share the story a little bit later um, in the evening. I'd like to go ahead and pivot to our um, to our panel um, because I think one of the things that we thought would be so important is ensuring that you know we have the voices of experts in our community who are paying attention to the POC, who are working with communities to ensure that folks have um, the information and the means that they, the assistance that they need to be able um, to meet these rate increases, as well as folks who are working to advocate and to share a different and alternative ways that we can, um, we can bring energy um, to our communities. And so I think one of the things that we wanted to be, to make sure is that the panelists have a chance to um, share who they are um, and reflect a little bit to us what piece of the elephant that they touch and what they think is important for us. So I'm gonna go ahead and start with Don. Um, Don Priest, our consumer advocate. Hello, is my microphone on? Can everybody hear me? It sounds like. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Grace. And thanks to all of you for inviting me. Uh, I am the state's consumer advocate, and I am clearly at the back end of the elephant. <laughs> <laughs> My job is representing the interests of residential utility customers at the Public Utilities Commission and anywhere else where those interests come up. So mostly I'm at the PUC, so I have lived at ground zero of the rate increases that everybody is talking about. And in that regard, I just want to say I'm really grateful to hear the stories of individual people struggling to deal with what's happened. You would be shocked, perhaps, to know that I don't hear enough of those stories. Um, I get lost in my own world at the Walker Building in Concord, where we're just dealing with these things in a very technical and ethereal way. It really helps to know viscerally how this actually helps people or how this actually has been affecting people. So I'm really grateful for that. So I uh, can tell you if you want exactly how we got to where we are. I don't have any magic bullets to offer about how we get out of where we are, but I do have a few suggestions. Uh, I want to remind everybody, and it has already been suggested to you a few times, that you are not obliged to take those outrageously high default energy service rates but if you do decide to turn your back on your utility and migrate into the world of competitive energy suppliers, there are some pitfalls to be aware of, and I can certainly talk about those. And I put together a sample disclosure statement from one of the competitive energy suppliers that I picked, and I can tell you what's good and bad about making a choice like that. 
And, um, and I can tell you that we're in there fighting every day to keep things as reasonable and affordable as possible. That good enough, Grace? Is there anything else you want me to talk about? Right? I think that that's wonderful. Can you share, maybe just very quickly, share a little bit about like what is the PUC? What why what is this body of people that decides <laughs> these uh, rate increases? Ah, well, uh, so electric companies and gas companies and water companies are monopolies, right? It doesn't make sense to have them competing with each other. And so, when you have a monopoly, you need somebody to make sure that they don't charge monopoly prices. So here in New Hampshire, we have a public utilities commission. It has three members. The commissioners are each appointed by the governor, confirmed by the executive council. And their main job is to make sure that the rates are just and reasonable, not too outrageously high, but they also can't go too low because if you go really low, then you have what are called confiscatory rates, meaning in effect, the government has taken the property of the utilities without just compensation. So unfortunately, that is really a big part of what's driving these outrageous rate increases because you can't tell the utility that they have to eat these costs. They, You could tell them that, but if you did tell them that, they would march right down to federal court, they'd file a lawsuit, and they would win. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Don. And so our next panelist is Leah Richards, who is the Directory, Director of Energy Assistance at the Community Action Program, Belknap, Merrimack Counties. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Leah Richards, and I am here as a resource. Uh, I work in electric assistance and fuel assistance for Belknap and Merrimack County. Uh, I will be happy to talk about some support programs. And I can tell you these stories and many, many other stories that I'm hearing on the daily about the challenge of affording everything, um, but certainly uh, electric and utility heat and heat in general. And so I am here to share with you. I, I left some flyers, but I'm happy to answer any questions about both the programs that run every year to assist with the cost of electric and the cost of heating. Um, these are programs that are income eligible programs, and these are programs that work whether it's Liberty or Eversource or a third party provider that you're using to supply your electric. And so whoever you are paying your electric to and your heat to, um, if your income for the household falls under the numbers on these sheets, you are eligible for some support. Um, we also this year have a state program that has been announced for about a month now that is specifically to assist with heat and electric costs. And this is for a uh, low median income household. And when I say household, I don't mean house, any dwelling. Um, you can live in an apartment, uh, you can live anywhere you are paying for heat or electric. If you are income eligible, we would love to help you because I know these costs are high. Um, we heard about these you know, increases coming. And I had been saying to my wife for so very long, these increases are gonna be 100% or more. And still when we received our first increased bill, it was shocking. And I know from talking to so many seniors on fixed incomes, so many households trying to stretch with food costs, and electric costs, they know how hard this is for so many people. Um, and we are seeing incredible numbers of applications coming in because there is a real fear, there's a real panic about how to afford this. So I'm here as whatever part of the elephant is the resource. I try to think of a good analogy, but I got nothing. Um, and here because I, I, I want to be able to help. Um, even these assistance programs aren't guaranteed to cover the costs, but they're meant to assist in any way that they can. So happy to answer any questions, tell you a little bit more about those programs. Um, but first, I'm going to pass it along in a quiet moment without too many children over here uh, <laughs> to the next panel. So thank you all for being here. Thank you so much, Leo. And so our third but never final uh, panelist is Dan Weeks, who is the employee owner and VP of business development at Revision Energy. Thank you so much, Grace. And great to be with you, Leah and Don. Uh, thank you all for putting up with a, a little bit of commotion here. Um, it, folks, I'm probably not the only one who deal with the craziness of everyday life, and my wife is teaching late today, so it was all or nothing, and I'm <laughs> glad we could all be here. Um, 
As Grace said, my name is Dan Weeks. I am one of almost 400 employee owners and thrilled that my colleague and co-owner Chris, uh, who works on designing a lot of residential clean energy systems, is here with us as well. And I'm honored to be on the journey of maybe to stick with the elephant analogy as I am joined here by the three little big reasons why I do the work I do. Um, I think I could say I'm perched on the back of the elephant with a pretty good view. Uh, one of our favorite family stories my wife and I tell is a, our first elephant ride before they arrived, and they like the view that we got from, from up there. And that's to say that I am fortunate to be working on the policy level and with our company. So for those who don't know, Revision Energy is an employee-owned solar company and a certified B corporation. B stand for benefit, and that means that as a company, we have committed ourselves to operating not for profit first and foremost, but for people and planet first. And it's a journey that we feel blessed to be on, trying to help families, as well as businesses, nonprofits, towns, cities, colleges, universities, transition away from fossil fuels and toward cheaper, cleaner energy sources from the sun and then using that electricity for transportation, for heating and cooling, et cetera. And in that work, we are fortunate to be looking toward the horizon, maybe as the sun is setting, and it's nice to be here at the McAuliffe Shepherd Discovery Center, all about space and our solar system. And I like to remind us that the biggest power plant of them all, the biggest nuclear reactor, is up there in the sky, about 93 million miles away, and it provides all of the energy that we need, just about all. And from a solar standpoint, the particular industry I find myself in, we get enough sunlight hitting the surface of the earth in one hour to harness it all, power human needs for a year, and to do so freely. Not that there isn't an upfront cost to install the technology, but unlike the other industries that we have relied on since the Industrial Revolution, coal and oil and cracked gas, et cetera, the fuel source, so to speak, is free. And it's for that reason that we, we get to, in the work that I do with Chris and others, get to look out to a future that is indeed brighter. From a cost standpoint, it's been now five years since solar officially became the cheapest form of energy on Earth. Again, because once you've installed it, even when you factor in the cost to install, you can continue generating power for decades at almost zero cost. Solar is followed closely behind by wind, which is the next cheapest form of power we have on Earth. And so the reason we are undergoing a rapid transition in this country, I would add not rapidly enough from a climate standpoint, but the reason this transition is underway is because of economics and because of the fundamentally deflationary dynamic of renewables, where again, that source of energy is free and abundant. So happy to talk more about that view and more practically. I suppose my quick energy story is that we are very blessed, of course, to live in a solar powered home and to fuel up our cars, our electric vehicles with, with power from the sun and heat and cool as well with heat pumps. Um, however, not all homes are ideal. Our ideal, ours is not. We happen to have an east-west facing roof and a fair bit of shade, so we don't get all of our power from the sun, especially since the family grew and we needed a bigger electric car. Um, so that's to say, like a lot of you, we're, we're paying electric bills too. And that points us to solutions because our roof is only what it is and it's shaded the way it's shaded and it's oriented the way it is. That excites us about the future in New Hampshire of community power, which will take different forms, but we're all familiar with CSA, Community Supported Agriculture, and we are on the cusp of seeing finally in New Hampshire, CSFs, community solar farms, where families can own a share, their 20, 30, 40 panels that they need to power all of their needs in a centralized solar farm and be able to get the credits from that. So even a family like ours that has solar on the roof but doesn't get enough power as we move toward electric vehicles and electric heating and cooling can also participate in that. So happy to talk more about those longer term opportunities. And maybe because I know there are a lot of activists in the room and I have huge appreciation for New Hampshire Renews and 
the youth movement and the other organizations like 350 that are doing this work and gathering us tonight. Uh, happy to talk a little bit about policy because it isn't an accident that New Hampshire is at the very bottom of the heap in New England and the Northeast when it comes to deployment of these cheaper and of course cleaner renewables. And from a policy standpoint, there is a lot of work to do, which will begin of course with the election on November 8th. Wonderful, thank you all so much. We just have a quick round of applause for our panel. <laughs> Well, thank you all for sharing a little bit about yourselves. And I know probably, I mean, I was jotting down some questions, so I'm sure other folks are jotting down questions. Um, but I did get just get a message that our um, our community member has, has joined us. And so I would like to just take a moment before we break out into our small group um, to invite Benny to, to, the, to the stage, <laughs> to the virtual stage, and share a little bit about how the rate increases have affected you in your family. Yes. Um... My name is Benny Rivera. I've been in New Hampshire since 1990. And right now I'm a pastor of Iglesia IBM Adulam. And um, my electrical bill is going up um, like a triple like I was paying last year. And I'm a retired person and I live in from my social security. And I try to get a solution how to lower my electrical and gas bill. But unfortunately, um, I tried the solar panel and after I have um, almost everything ready to get my um, solar panel. The company ever sources the one I have um, for years since I've been in this country. And they deny um, the company Sunroom uh, put my panel because, you know, I pay my bill sometime two months behind because I didn't have, you know, all the money to pay it in once and I was making payment plan. And, you know, they didn't help like for me get the, um, lower my bills. They say no and, and I couldn't get it, my, my solar panel, I don't know if any other program I could get it because, you know, if they um, increase, the, this keep increasing um, the electrical, um, the oil bill, keep increasing, how we going to pay, you know, um, that amount of money if we try in other sources and the system don't help us. That is, um, you know, my story. Wonderful, thank you so much, Benny. And it's true, I mean, it's, this is happening right up all across the state, whether you're a renter or a homeowner, whether you live in the cities, Nashua or Manchester, or, or in the rural areas, this really is affecting all of us. And I know when I got that bill and we had just put our AC away, so I did not even understand how one month when we were using the AC, it was $150. And then the next month when there was no AC, it had doubled in price. So thank you so much, everyone, for sharing um, tonight. And so with that being said, I know there's a lot of information, a lot of stories, a lot of our own, you know, like, well, yeah, how is this affecting me? Um, we are going to break out into our small groups at this moment, just to give ourselves a little bit of time to reflect kind of back at each other, start to be in conversation with one another about what we've heard, any questions that are coming up, anything that's coming up in your group. And so um, I know on Zoom, folks will be using a whiteboard feature that our Zoom, um, our Zoom facilitators will share uh, more information about in the chat. Um, so please do check that and they'll walk you through how to add um, your thoughts to that group whiteboard. And then here, you'll see on each of your tables, you've got post-its, you've got some pens, you've got some big, um, big newsprint paper as well. So we want you all to just take a few minutes. We're going to take about 10 minutes 
to just start to brainstorm, reflect back kind of what you what you've heard. What does this mean for you? How is this showing up for you? Um, how is it showing up for other people in your family, in your community that you you know? What questions do you have for our panelists? I mean, like I said, I've been jotting down my questions. I got a ton. So please beat me to it um, because there is so much critical information and the best ways that we can really advocate for ourselves to make these changes, to understand what's going on is definitely in, in tapping into um, the knowledge um, and the, in the work and the, the people, the folks here in our community um, who can help us get that information. So please take a few minutes. We're gonna, um, we're gonna just like hang, hang out write, chat, um, be in conversation, and then we'll come back. I will ping you all when we've got a minute left, and then we'll come back um, and start to share both what we uh, shared within our groups, any reflections, and then any questions as well for our panelists. So go ahead and feel free to get started. And if you are sitting by yourself, are we all back? All right, awesome. So thank you all, everyone, for taking that time to chat with each other, to reflect back what you've heard, how this has impacted you, and any questions um, that may have come up. So let's just go ahead and open it up. We got 20 minutes together to share, um, opening it up and just sharing uh, kind of what came up for you all. Um, for folks who are in our Zoom, um, we can hear you. So if our team, our Zoom moderators have anyone who'd like to go, please do raise your hand and we'll make sure that we toggle back and forth. So why don't we go ahead and start? We'll start here at the table and then we'll go back and forth. So we'll start with one table and then we'll open it up to our Z participants and then I'll go to the second table and open it up to our Z participants. Um, so I'm gonna go right here at table one. Um, what came up with you all, for you all? Anybody want to come and share at the microphone? Um, some stuff that came up for us is that we need like good representation in the state house, but also like, um, like probably a new governor, um, <laughs> and, um, that, um, it's good to have like a solid renewable, like energy plan and like hopefully New Hampshire can get one because we don't have one. Um, Something about tap agencies, I'm sorry, these are just notes, they're not sentences, and breaking monopolies. Thank you so much, Erica. Were there any questions that came up for folks that folks wanted answered? I do have a question for Ben. Um, sorry to put you on the spot, but I just wondered, um, as you know, we have solar panels that my husband and I, we bought them. Uh, and we stole them. But now we, since three months ago, our system broke because the importer inverter um, had damage and we can't even find a part. So for three months in a row, we went from um, like the first bill that we relied was 350. And then the second bill that went uh, up, it was 420. And then last week we paid $498 for electricity. Because we don't, we can't find a car to uh, uh, fix our um, solar uh, system, and I just wonder if we install it ourselves. Um, is there any way? Do you know is any way that we can like try to find a car, or if you know if we qualify to get a new solar panels installed in our house since uh, we bought them, we didn't um, get it by credit. Um, so I don't know. If, you know, is any system or any way we can like um, get our, um, you know, our system either fixed or you know, the solar panel be sold? Thank you for that question, Maria. I'm so sorry to hear that. That is very frustrating, especially as rates are spiking. So, for our company, I know we didn't install your system. Um, we actually provide warranty coverage and have a rapidly growing service department that. Um, we received many requests from uh, owners of systems that we didn't install, in addition to, of course, serving the ones we did. So I'll maybe make a little public service announcement. We are desperately trying to hire and train more electricians. The demand is so great. And we have actually a new campaign we call Electricians Will Save the World <laughs> because it, we are going to have a prayer of maintaining a livable climate. 
literally preserving the habitability of our planet for future generations, including these little ones, we need to much more rapidly deploy clean energy as well as meet the maintaining systems like here's Maria. Um, so that's a, a sort of backward, long-winded way of saying um, we, we have a service team and could could try to fix your inverter. It should be a pretty simple process. We install thousands of inverters and hundreds of thousands of solar panels, so it's certainly been done before. Um, but we won't be able to get there tomorrow or probably next week because the demand again is just so high. Um, happy to chat with you directly. Hopefully your installer has a workmanship warranty and warranties on inverters are typically 10 to 12, sometimes 15 years on solar panels are 25 years. So it certainly should be covered, but I know time is money in this case. So I, I hope that you can get them out. And if not, we certainly wanna try and help you. We have a team that can do it and we can put it in the queue and try to get to you as soon as possible. Thanks for your question. Thank you so much, Dan, and thanks for that question, Maria. Any other questions from Group One? All right. Uh, so before we go to Group Two and Three and Four, um, just very quickly to our Zoom, um, our Zoom family here. Are there any questions um, or reflections that, that folks uh, came up with that they'd like to share? Are you talking to Group Two or anybody on the Zoom? Anybody on the Zoom, I'm not sure how many groups you all had. So if there was a group one, then let's go with group one on Zoom. Thanks. Hi, I'm Kaya Morris. I use her pronouns, and I'm the executive director for Rights and Democracy. Um, so our group actually didn't have many questions. We got into a lengthy conversation about why the tax rates, why the rate hikes are at the levels they are, and the ability to import and export oil and natural gas, and it's... Um, impacts on the market, but we did hear some powerful narratives around how rates have doubled in cases for some families, tripled on um, and others. Um, and it has had some serious impact on most of the people in the room. Some have felt that have recognized the rate hikes, but they didn't impact them positively or negatively necessarily. But for some others, it's really been um, very daunting for them. So thank you for the sharing the space. Thank you so much, Kaya. All right, so let's go if there's nothing more from group one. All right, then we'll pass it over to group two. So group two, any reflections or questions here in person? Anything that folks would like to share? Yeah. So I think we're the question group. <laughs> and I think it's six different questions. Um, we do one. One and a half. Yeah. One, <laughs> chance to answer. So I think this one's possibly for Dawn. Why is New Hampshire so far behind? Which time we got? Briefly. Uh, I, I, I do think it's a matter of the public policy that trickles down from the folks that you elect to be the chief executive of the state and to be uh, members of the general court. All of the authority that the Public Utilities Commission has is authority that is delegated to it by the legislature. So it is, a, it, it is an administrative agency. It gets its marching orders from the legislature. It does nothing that the legislature has not told it or authorized it to do. So it all flows back to the uh, elected officials and the elections. Um, is, that, is that an adequate answer to your question? Um, what role can citizens play with the PUC? Um, is there some kind of role that public can play? Um, and the answer to that question is absolutely yes. You know, the PUC is not this mysterious fortress that no one may enter. Uh, everybody has the right to participate in PUC proceedings. You can even intervene and become a full party. If you are a customer of the or a utility that's affected by a particular PUC proceeding, uh, historically, the PUC has decided you have standing to intervene, and there's no reason not to. You uh, you acquire very few obligations and lots of rights by intervening, but even if you don't intervene, you can file comments and tell the PUC what you think it should do, uh, and the PUC has a very good online uh, virtual file room, so you can keep track of 
Do you see proceedings that are interesting to you? You can even ask the PUC to put you on its uh, courtesy service list. So it will email you things that it decides in cases you're interested in. So it, 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 it should be, and in fact is, accessible. And as a follow-up question to that, is the PUC the right place to put the pressure? Yes, absolutely. When it comes to utility <laughs> rates, the PUC is the back end of the elephant. Dan, how do people in towns push or get involved in community power? In community power. Thank you for the question. If I could go back just for a moment um, to reinforce what Don said, I get several emails a week from the PUC concerning different dockets that I am involved in on behalf of our company. They can get a bit technical and you need time and some expertise maybe to, to fully engage. And so one good vehicle for engagement for any citizens who want to be more informed and be supporting meaningful engagement is the organization, the nonprofit Clean Energy New Hampshire, Clean Energy NH, has a lot of members and they are regularly before the PUC trying to advocate for, I think, the same values that are represented in this room. Um, so I encourage that. If I can also make a brief moment, I'd comment on policy and then speak to community power. Just to put in perspective where we are in New Hampshire. So we are the only state in New England that has no greenhouse gas emission reduction goals. Our renewable portfolio standard, the extent to which we seek to transition to renewables ends at 25% in 2025. Uh, other states have goals of 100% or 80%. Within that 25%, the goal is 0.7% of energy from solar. Most of the renewable power comes from um, biomass, which is local and renewable, but is also polluting. Um, and hydro is another important source. And as a consequence, we have about 1% of our electricity coming from the sun compared to 20% in mass, 17% in Vermont, five, and it will soon be 10% in Maine because of the, the pace of growth there. And that is the... PUC implementing policies from the legislature. So I think engagement in elections, engagement in the legislative proceedings, there are many bipartisan bills that have been passed that would have moved us much more rapidly forward, dealing with issues like community power, where there's been some movement, fortunately, but in many other areas, bipartisan legislation was vetoed by the current governor, and that I think more than any other single factor explains why we are so far behind and also uh, we explained why our rates are so high. Community power has been a bright spot where there has been good compromise and some willingness from the governor to, to allow those efforts to move forward. We have over a dozen towns in New Hampshire that have coalesced to form the Community Power Coalition of New Hampshire. They welcome new town members, so if you're involved with your town, it's something I'm happy to connect you to the coalition. You can bring uh, the possibility of membership forward to your town select board or your city council. And we are seeing good movement on the first phase of community power. We expect the first communities such as Lebanon, Hanover, Keene, Nashua, these are some of the most active so far. We expect the first ones to begin offering alternative default power to the members of their community which is very likely to be less expensive than what we get from the utilities. And then in subsequent years, we know many of these communities will seek to create their own local generation portfolios to contract with solar, potentially wind generation, potentially hydro, in order to provide not just cheaper power, but cleaner power that is locally sourced and also brings local investment and jobs. That's a couple years out probably, but the first step of providing cheaper default power from existing generators will start to come next year. And I do encourage you to look up the Community Power Coalition of New Hampshire and encourage your town to join it. I don't want to leave you out. <laughs> um, have the electric heating assistance programs lost funding or is that just a rumor? Have we lost funding? No, um, but that doesn't mean they won't. Um, I mean, the fuel assistance program is a federal program. Um, just as you're hearing from the gentleman on either side, 
policy and elections will decide the fate of some of these programs, but no, they have not lost funding. And in fact, the state program is money pulled out of our state surplus to help uh, with the cost of heating and electric. And the question that came up is that can someone talk about the ISO and what their role is? <laughs> oh man, that really is the back end of the industry. So what you're talking about is ISO New England, which is actually a regional transmission organization. It is a nonprofit organization. It has a couple of important jobs. One of them is it operates the bulk power transmission system. It's actually owned by the region utilities, but they operate it. And they also oversee the markets through which energy trades at wholesale. And so the, the source of those monumental prices that you're seeing in your retail electric bills really is the marketplace that's overseen uh, by ISO New England. So it is an enormously powerful and important organization. If you would think it should be transparent and accessible and extremely responsive to the people who ultimately pay for all this stuff, it is the opposite of those things. And man, I just am always out there at the gate of the ISO, you know, with my torch and my pitchfork. <laughs> I'm going to an ISO New England Board of Directors meeting next week in Providence, Rhode Island. Give those people a peace of my mind. I do want to mention energy efficiency, uh, just to throw that in, uh, because uh, my friend Dan is correct that renewables are better and cheaper than using fossil fuels. But even better than all of that, the cheapest way to meet the next unit of demand for energy is not to use it, to get more work out of the energy we're already using. In other words, megawatts with an N are cheaper than megawatts with an M. We are dead last, not only in New England, but in the whole Northeast when it comes to energy efficiency. What we do have is available to you at nhsaves.com. We need a lot more of it because there is a lot more to be had that is cost effective, meaning it saves the people money who actually use it at their homes and businesses, and it saves everybody money. It is a win-win situation, or as Amory Lovins likes to say, it is the lunch you get paid to eat. <laughs> I love that. Thank you so much for these wonderful questions. So to toss it back to our uh, Zoom family here, I know Walter had a question that he wanted to share. So Walter, if you are um, still there, please unmute and share your question. Hello. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Um, so big picture, the problem we have is that for 40 years now, I guess 50 really, uh, our energy prices are usually very low, but then every once in a while we get a spike and people are understandably upset about that. But the reason we're still using fossil fuels, even though they are gonna make life much worse for future generations through climate change and make life worse for people today through regular pollution, is that by and large, most of the time they're really cheap. So, um, from a climate standpoint, when they get more expensive, which makes renewables cheaper relatively, that's actually good. But there are obviously two huge problems. One, uh, most people can't afford uh, a, a rapid and huge increase in energy prices. And two, when these energy uh, inc price increases in fossil fuels are, are uh, come so quickly and frequently are so transitory, they don't really lead to changes in lifestyle that we need. So, uh, you know, gas got to five bucks a gallon, but I didn't really see people stop buying 5,000 pound, 400 horsepower gas cars, and therefore Ford and GM didn't stop making them. So, whereas if you knew that the price of gas was gonna go up gradually, literally for the rest of your life, then that would influence decisions. And so there is a policy, carbon fee and dividend that solves both those problems. Uh, first, the carbon fee starts off very low, but it goes up every year. And so anyone making a long-term decision, what kind of car to buy, put solar on the roof, what kind of house to build or buy, uh, will have an incentive uh, to use less fossil fuels because over the life of that long-term investment, uh, the, the renewable choice will be cheaper. And this is obviously true for companies as well, even more so, a utility building a new plant. Um, and then the second thing is, if, it, if instead of taking the revenue from the carbon fee and just putting it into the vast federal till and spending it in all different ways, you rebate it back to American households uh, exactly per capita and even shares, kids get half a share, 
adults get a full share, it actually becomes a progressive economic policy because the least affluent people use the least energy, and yet they're going to get a rebate based on the average American's use, which is you know 16 tons of CO2 a year. So the 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 people with private jets and several mansions are going to be paying in a lot more than they get back. The people you know living in a modest apartment in Manchester and taking city buses are going to get back a lot more than they put in. But everyone is going to have the same incentive to use uh, fewer fossil fuels. And the fact that everyone will know that this is going up on a schedule every year will mean that the price increases actually do alter behavior. Whereas, you know, people can't react to a, a, a doubling or tripling of energy prices in a couple of months. They can't change where they live. They probably can't change what they're driving. All those things, it's really, all this, these uh, periodic spikes aren't doing anything for climate. They're just making people's living standards go down. So I just wondered if your group has looked into this at all. It's, um, there is a, there are a bunch of bills in the federal level, where, which is where it has to happen. Uh, there's one in the House that has 95 co-sponsors, which is not nothing. We need more. And in New Hampshire, uh, Annie Custer in District 2 has sponsored it. Chris Pappas in District 1 has not sponsored it. So I, I just think it's good for people to check it out. Uh, you can Google carbon fee and dividend, and uh, you'll see it solves a lot of problems. But Thank you so much, Walter. So okay, we'll Thanks for letting me. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. So let's give our panelists a chance to respond to that, and then we'll move on to the next piece. Any responses, panelists? Um, I'm familiar with carbon fee and dividend, and I didn't hear anything that I disagree with or can refute. Uh, I think the uh, likelihood that Congress is going to send a carbon fee and dividend bill to the president for his signature anytime in the foreseeable future is very, very low. And so, therefore, I haven't spent a lot of time uh, working on that particular policy initiative, but it's very well developed, and the arguments for it are quite compelling. Awesome. Thank you so much, Don. Any other responses? No. Okay. Um, I, have, I have a quick follow up on that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Hold on. Oh. <laughs> Am I correct in my understanding that Canada already has enacted a carbon fee and dividend, uh, you know, program of some sort? I don't know. Yeah, that's, that's correct. Yep. Yeah. Can anyone comment on how that has played out so far? Has it? I mean. We're all familiar with unintended consequences. It certainly sounds good in theory. You know, do we know how this is working in practice anywhere else in the world? So any response to that? And just want to be mindful of the time. We do have, I think, five other groups to go through. So if responses can be quick, so we'd be thoughtful of our um, other participants. Yeah, very briefly, um, it is actually a standard policy mechanism in a lot of other industrialized countries in Canada and the European Union. And we do see significantly lower carbon intensity across most of those. Of course, Canada is a major producer and exporter of fracked gas. Um, but across the European Union, the amount of carbon pollution per person is substantially lower than here in our wonderful United States. And that is attributed, at least in part, to the use of this mechanism, which almost all economists would strongly favor. It, it does make a, a lot of economic sense it has been politically very challenging. So I think it's one of a number of policy solutions that we ought to be working on, but not the only one um, because of how challenging it has been. In the past, it's had bipartisan support. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of bipartisanship in Washington these days. Ain't that the truth? All right, well, thank you so much for that, for those questions and the responses from our panelists. So tossing it back to group two online, uh, do we have any questions from group two um, and anything that folks would like to share? And again, I'll just remind folks that we are running a little bit short on time, and I know we're going to be losing Don soon because um, his students uh, also need his time and not just us uh, community members and advocates. So let's be sure if you could you want to prioritize questions to Don um, and just want to make sure that folks don't also have if you have any questions for Leah as well. I'm going to go ahead and toss it to group two online. Uh, I think that was uh, the group I was in, and we actually struggled to get to actual questions, so we're off the hook there. And just briefly, um, our group had kind of a variety of people. Some had 
um, solar panels and things. Some didn't have quite enough. And then some of us also are struggling with those prices. Um, some of the comments on what we thought we'd like to see done um, was uh, number one was stand up to Eversource because Eversource treats New Hampshire differently than um, other states like Massachusetts because of the legislative atmosphere. Um, but uh, the other thing that we talked about was income eligibility isn't uh, well high enough for the subsidies for for many of us, and um, and also like we'd li also like to see better programs for low income people so that they can actually get those renewables and help their pocketbooks out, but also the environment at the same time. Um, and so, if anybody has any information on, on those two or three items, we'd love to hear about that. The one thing I just wanted to add, I talked a lot about fuel and electric assistance, but the other program community action offers is a weatherization program. And um, we have one of the oldest housing markets in the country, and that means energy inefficiency. And so one of the things that, um, you know, fuel assistance, electric assistance helps in the short term, weatherization absolutely helps pocketbooks and environment in the long term. So just to add that. Thanks. Thank you so much, Leah. And I actually just have a quick question before I call on group three here in person. Um, so for folks who are not in the Belknap Merrimack um, counties, can you share a little bit about like caps and, you know, are there other caps in other counties? Just if folks live elsewhere, like where can they go? What sure. If you go to capnh.org, you'll see all of the community action programs across the state. Community action is uh, across the vast majority of the country, and we are the agencies helping to uh, helping with everything but animals is often what we say. Uh, with food insecurity, with fuel and electric assistance, um, with uh, the, the WIC program and the Head Start program and the Meals on Wheels program, a lot of those local federal state programs are run by community action agencies. So capnh.org. And if you put in your town, you'll figure out which of the five agencies in the state serves your area. Wonderful, thank you so much. So I'm gonna to toss it over to group three. We're gonna keep this going. Um, any reflections or questions from group three? And we'll go back and forth. Any questions? We toss it over to sale. Hey all one quick question is just like, you know, hundreds of thousands of people are like spending way more money on energy. Like who benefits from the change? Like who benefits from the high rates? Good question. Money's gotta go somewhere. Uh, well, I can tell you that the money is going to the companies that get win the bidding process to provide default energy service to uh, our utilities. So it's not really Eversource, Unitil, Liberty, or the electric co-op that are benefiting. It's really the wholesale energy providers like uh, Next Era and Constellation are the two companies that won the bid for Eversource's load. So, so if you want to scrutinize a company and look at what their shareholders are getting and what their executives are getting, those are the companies to really zero in on, I think. Thank you very much, Don. And so if there are, oh, one more question from group three. Thank you. Um, I, I, our discussion at our table revolved a lot about supply, where it comes from, how it's priced, how it's generated, and a little bit of a discussion about how we actually got here from the restructuring uh, of the electric utility industries in the 1990s. So I think what I can offer is that um, I think this group would be really good to put together a workshop, an on the ground workshop, uh, which will educate people in the community in terms of well, how to actually shop for energy. Um, where, as Don was mentioning, uh, who the various vendors are that produce the electricity, uh, what's their markup, how do they have to operate. So I think it would be really beneficial for this group and for people who are looking for this information to have an on the ground workshop. And um, that might be the most productive thing that I see coming out of this session tonight. So thank you. Thank you so much, Joe. Yeah, and I can comment on that. Yeah, please. I love that we're sort of digging, pulling back layers of the onion here and looking at supply. And Don was right to bring up ISO and system operator, which governs our wholesale market. Anyone interested in just doing some starting to educate yourself, check out the app ISO to go. And right now I'm looking at the retail, sorry, the wholesale electricity costs in New England across all of our six states. 
I'm also looking at the current fuel mix, the current supply right now, it's 50% fracked gas, 28% nuclear, 12% renewables. Again, that's a lot of biomass still, and then also 10% hydro. Um, so you can check that out, and there's a lot of digging one can do. Great resources also from the U.S. Energy Information Administration, which gives you price data going back decades and exact percent of fuel sources, different generators, where they're located, and on and on. There's some great resources out there. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dan. And actually, very quick question to our panelists, perhaps, so you could share this with us. Where, If people did want to change their supplier, where would they go? You know, is there an easy resource that people can go to change their energy suppliers? Energy.nh.gov is the State Department of Energy website. And there is in one of their pull down menus a place that you can go to find the competitive energy suppliers and compare their prices. It varies by which utilities service territory you live in. Uh, so, yeah, that's where to go. Thank you so much. All right. So keeping it moving. I know we're probably going to lose Don soon, but we will, you know, enjoy him while he's here. Um, so we are on to group number, I believe, I think group three online. Hey, yeah. All right. Yeah, group three. Uh, I'm Lisa. I'm with 350 New Hampshire. I use she, her pronouns. We had some short questions and one of them might have been answered in our own chat. I did some Googling off to the side. That question was, is there a certain time period where heat and electricity can't be shut off due to the time of year, like in the winter? And um, I'm not sure what year I have here, but I have November 15th to March 31. An electric utility may not disconnect a customer service um, at certain levels. It depends who, what type of electricity or gas you're getting but it's either under $225, under $125, or under $450. For some of these people, that's just one month. Um, so any response to how to make sure people have the lights on and have heat this winter? Well, uh, let me just respond to that by saying that is a correct statement about the rules that apply to disconnections in the winter. There are those limitations in place starting on November 15th, lasting through the end of March. I strongly urge everybody, if you get a disconnection notice from your utility, pick up the phone and call them. Those notices are scary, but at least one of the big utilities, I'm not going to mention its name, but its initials are Eversource, <laughs> send out a disconnection notice to customers just to get you to call them. They do not actually intend to disconnect you. The utilities don't like the horrible publicity they get when they disconnect people in the dead of winter, but they do need to get your attention. There are services and help available to you. You have paid for those things. So do not be afraid or ashamed or reluctant to, ex uh, to expect or demand or ask for your right to participate in those programs. Eversource has an arrearage management program, so they'll actually forgive some of your past due bill, but you have to call them and talk to them. I'm not here to defend Eversource, but I am here to say that you are better off engaging with them than ignoring them. And that goes for Liberty, Unitil, and the Electric Co-op as well. Thank you so much, Don. And just actually, so quick follow-up, I know we still have folks online, but for maybe for Leah, is there something like if folks are struggling maybe with now calling um, these energy companies to like kind of take advantage of some of these programs, is there anything that um, community action programs can help with in terms of supporting people to, to reach out to folks to the energy companies? Or um, is there some sort of resource or someone that they could call maybe just to get, you know, so uh, some extra support? Sure. So I we, we have heard some challenging stories in terms of trying to get in touch with some of uh, the utility companies. And so if you've got a disconnect notice, if someone is really struggling, um, contact your local community action program. There are local resource centers across the state. Um, and there are some programs that can assist. I just today, um, you know, we heard from a woman who's stage four cancer and has a disconnect notice. And um, we have some programs that we can help with. So absolutely, if someone's really struggling, contact your community action program um, and someone hopefully can assist. Awesome, thank you so much. So then back to group three, any other questions or reflections before we keep it moving? Uh, is there any way to get a prediction of how the six month review will result in rate changes? Is that just a 
releases every six months or can we have any prediction that it's gonna go up further? Uh, I do own a crystal ball. <laughs> yes. So I don't have a crystal ball, I actually do have one. And I, I, there is some possibility, I would say, that you'll see a modest decline. Why is that? Well, because the next six month period that starts, I think in February, has the summer in it. And in general, uh, worldwide energy prices are lower in the summer, at least in the Northern hemisphere, than they are in the winter. So, I, you know, the real question is what will the prices look like one year from now as we gear up to go through yet another super cold, harsh winter? And the answer is, hmm, I guess my crystal ball starts to get a little foggy when I get to that point. And then, yeah. Sorry, a quick additional comment. The reason I think some context may be interesting, the reason we do historically see peaking rates in the winter is because we are so reliant on frack gas, which we use both to heat and generate electricity. So as we move <laughs> away toward energy efficiency and renewable sources, that level, there should be a leveling off. And I have to put a plug in to wind, it's not my industry, but uh, just today, we got to cut the ribbon on a 4.7 megawatt solar project in one of the main cities, South Portland, Maine, um, that is now increasingly routine. We're doing a lot of community solar farms there where hundreds of members own their little share of a community solar farm and they get credits every month on their electric bill. And if they've got a big family with a lot of electricity consumption, they buy two or three shares. If they're a small family, they buy a single share, what have you. So the model is tried and true, has been done in a lot of other states. But unfortunately, because of some of the many vetoes I alluded to has been very difficult to scale up in New Hampshire. One bright spot has been that there are some programs specific to low and moderate income folks and so one of our highest priorities as a company, as a B Corp, is to really start to deploy those programs. There's an LMI adder where the net metering value for projects delivering power to low and moderate income families, and that's defined as folks with incomes up to three times the federal poverty line, so about 80000 per family of four. Those individuals can have that enhanced value on the net metering value of generation from a community solar farm. We are committed starting next year to finally bring these projects forward, as well as more traditional community solar farms, which aren't connected to one's income, but where the individual members can actually own a share. So the two models in brief are, are those owned by members and then those financed by uh, impact investors, but where the users of the power receiving those additional credits um, are low-income folks. We are working with housing authorities and, and affordable housing providers. We've built dozens of projects for clean housing, Nevesta, and Lake Region developers, um, and others, and we are eager to do more of those projects, but we do need to make it available to the general public. If we, based on what happens on November 8th, can elect the majority that would raise the net metering cap from this artificially low one megawatt up to five megawatts, like all the neighboring states, the economies of scale allow these projects to really start to come online. So that's where all of our action as voters, as citizens matters a lot. Even though under the current constraints, my company at least is committed to starting to serve this market. So um, that will be a big priority for us next year. And we'll try to spread the word about how folks can be members. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dan. <clears throat> so I know, again, we are running short, 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 short on time. There's never enough of that. Um, but I want to just toss it back to our group for um, one question coming in. And I also want to remind folks that we, uh, Zon will be leaving us very shortly. So if there are questions that you would like focus to him, please prioritize that. Thanks, Grace. I really appreciate it. Um, I think to Dan, you touched on it, uh, net metering. Uh, when I came to this state, it was super exciting. Uh, it was uh, super close to being passed. Uh, maybe if all y'all could maybe give your perspective on net metering and maybe reinvigorize the folks in here on why it's important and what it could be doing uh, in the future. Okay. <laughs> 
I used to say that I uh, the secret to my success as consumer advocate was avoiding any public discussion of net metering, but I, I, I've, I've changed my stance radically in the last few weeks because we're just receiving the results of a big value of distributed energy resources study that is uh, was sponsored by the Department of Energy, and it reveals that there is very there would be if we just keep up with the net metering scheme that we have now very little in the way of so-called cross subsidization so you know we worry about the solar haves being subsidized by the solar have-nots in some unfair and unreasonable way it turns out that that is a mythic concern that in fact if we stick with net metering the value to the people who do it is so great their bills go down by like 92 percent between now and 2035 and everybody else's bills go up by about one percent so that's a trivial amount, I think, of cross-subsidization, and it just means that everybody should listen to Dan and jump on board with um, net metering opportunities that don't require you to have a big backyard or a south-facing or a west-facing roof. So I, I really do think, I, I, I've come around to this way of thinking quite strongly just in the last few weeks that net metering plays a really important role in the future of energy here in New Hampshire. As does all distributed generation, the more energy we can produce at or near the place where it's used, the better off we're all going to be. For anyone who wants to stay on, maybe not tonight, but have a lengthy discussion about the, the analysis, it's pretty fascinating stuff, at least if you're sort of a nerd like me. But I do have to add just one note because it's been a really Big and I would argue distracting debate over these years. We've heard from the corner office that net metering produces this massive cost shift, where, as Don just said, the solar have not subsidized those with solar. The 1% so called cost shift that this story, that this study found, is using the most unrealistically conservative assumptions, assigning no value to the environmental benefits that are known to result from the transition to reduce hundreds of lives a year and cost billions of dollars in lost economic activity because of the pollution that comes from our existing energy infrastructure from fossil fuels. And it does not look at storage, which extends the benefits of distributed renewables, such as keeping that cheap, clean daytime solar power useful into the evening. So the, the numbers actually paint a very exciting picture about the future and I think provide the empirical basis that hopefully our leaders will take seriously in allowing that meter to expand. That will allow us to finally gain some ground while adding many millions of dollars of local investment and lots of new local jobs and all the rest. Obviously I'm biased, but I would <laughs> love to give you those numbers and happy to, to share more. It's, it's pretty exciting what we learn. Awesome, thank you so much. And so I know we have met, we've reached all the groups here in person and there's quite a few questions that are coming in through the chat. So I'd like to open it up to the last two groups um, as well as any any of the questions that were coming up through the chat any of our moderators um, want to flag those. So why don't we go ahead with group three, sorry, group four and five um, and then open it up to chat questions. Um, so the moderators of group four and five um, have left. So if you were in one of those groups, I have the questions written down, um, but I would encourage you to ask them um, yourselves as you will probably do a better job than I will. Um, so I would encourage um, the group four and five uh, people to unmute if you want. Okay. Uh, if not, I do have, oh, Bruce, were you unmuting just then? Uh, yes, I did. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Uh, I think the big question that I had <clears throat> is, how did we get into this situation? How do we get out of it so that we, we don't fall into the same traps that we, we have? And I, I have a feeling it must be through who we elect. So everyone should do the research as far as who they vote for, this next election cycle. Thank you. Just to quickly respond to that, we will be closing with some actions that folks can take um, that answer some of that, but if our panelists have any response to that, we certainly want to make sure that they can share. Um, but we will be sure to you know, end the night with some very specific actions that people can take to, to share now why, why this is a problem, as well as advocating in the future to make sure that we can, uh, we can lower these costs. 
Any other questions or any any other questions from our panel from our uh, group in Zoom world? Um, I I don't know if the consumer advocate really touched on this. I think he alluded in the beginning that there were some negative um, possibilities from switching to one of the other suppliers. And I just wondered if he might comment on what he means by that. Uh, sure. So if you switch to a competitive supplier, you are going to end up making a commitment for an extended period. So the competitive suppliers are all offering plans that last a minimum of a year, I think. And so what you trade is some um, rate discount for uh, locking in a price for an extended period of time. So that isn't necessarily a bad thing to do, but you have to check, read the fine print about what the penalty is for backing out of the contract. I just did the math on the one that I put out on the table here, and you save enough money in two months on a typical electric bill to be able to afford the $100 fee you would pay if you decide you want to back out of the contract. Uh, later on if the electric rates go down. The other thing you have to be really careful about is what happens at the end of the rate period you agree to, because what the competitive suppliers are doing is they're giving you a teaser rate, and then if you do nothing at the end of the rate period, they put you on their worst rate, which is going to be even worse than the default energy service rate. So you're committing yourself to a certain amount of vigilance if you migrate out into, into the competitive supply universe, but if you're willing to be that vigilant, it is a good idea. I think ultimately the answer is community power aggregation. People need a trusted agent. They don't want to sit around and worry all the time about where their energy is coming from and how much they're using and when they're using it. That's just, you know, people need to live their lives or enjoy their retirements or raise their kids. So that is why it is a good idea to get your municipality to be the bulk buyer for electricity for everybody in town, unless you opt out. It's just a great idea and I really think 2023 is going to be the year of community power in New Hampshire. Um, very quickly, I use a competitor and I agree with everything that Dawn said. You have to do your research on these companies. Um, I research them, I follow all the fine print, and you have to look. I've changed from one company to another, so I've had two different companies. So just do the research and look at their consumer ratings. Thanks, Anne. That's great advice. Uh, more questions from our Zoom group? We're back. Um, does anybody know about, there was rumor of a rebate, and it seemed like that $100 one that Governor Zunu talked about when these rate hikes were released is not happening. But is there any sort of rebate maybe middle and low income dwellings can get that's going to be from the state itself? So the $100 that Governor Sununu initially talked about is what has morphed into the current state uh, program. And so it is a program that you have to apply for, but it is for uh, more median income households. So for a household of four, um, up to about $93,000, $93 you're eligible. Um, and that's up to $650. I understand the $100 sort of went away, um, but it became this state program for electric and heat assistance. What is that program called? Just to it is the state emergency fuel assistance program and the state supplemental electric benefit program. Um, and the way you apply to those programs is to apply to fuel or electric assistance. It's the same process. And what we are finding is some people are applying for the state program and are delighted to find that they actually qualify for um, the annual fuel and electric assistance program because we say low income, um, but the the rate, what, what low income means is different for every program. Um, and so for a house of four, just under $75,000 annually is actually eligible for uh, the fuel and electric assistance program. So whether it's the state program or our always existing program, uh, you can apply for a community action program. Wonderful, thank you so much. Any other questions? Uh, maybe we'll take one or two more. And if there are more questions that are coming up, we can add that, you know, we can share that with our panelists, um, but just want to be mindful of the time as we reach, uh, we close out on the eight o'clock hour. So one or two more questions and then we will move on to actions. Anything from our Zoom family? Yes, hi. I'd like to add something. 
if that's okay. Yes, please. Um, just to add to the uh, precautions, if you are um, getting uh, your electricity from a competitive supplier, and if you are also in a community that will be starting community power, you will not be automatically enrolled in community power if you are on a competitive supplier. So once that starts in your community, you will have to actively opt in. So that's just another thing to know. Wonderful, thank you so much for that comment. So thank you all for your questions, um, for your comments, for your information. Many thanks to our panelists. Um, can we just give them a quick round of applause for joining us this evening and sharing this afternoon? And so to close us out, and again, for those who still have burning questions, please do put them in the chat. We will collect them. We will get those answers and we will share a follow-up email after this event. But to close us, yes. So we're tossing it to actions. Can you save that comment yeah. and give it to us after? Okay, awesome. Thank you, Chris. So we will collect it and share. It's not going to just stop here, people, because the work doesn't stop here. So I'm going to give it to you. So thank you for our panelists. We're going to let them go, return to their evening. Um, but we're going to close out with Erica Perez, um, who's going to share some actions that we can take now um, and the actions that we can take for the future so that we can make sure this doesn't keep happening to our community. Absolutely. Thank you, Grace. Um, so some of the things that we can do is right now, there's about to be an election. Um, there's still time to approach candidates. Um, we can get them on camera and we can ask them specific questions. There we go. Questions like, will you go on record to ask the PUC to reverse its decision to allow electric companies to increase its rates by 100% or more? Will you vote for rate caps that would prohibit utility companies from increasing rates by 100% while enjoying record profits? Will you vote to diversify New Hampshire's energy resources to include more renewable energy and less dependent on fossil fuels. And you can find these questions outside on the table. Um, you can also share on social media, especially Twitter, tag our individual orgs, and also New Hampshire Renews at Renews NH. Um, and use the hashtag stop NH utility hikes. Um, we will be following up with people via email. There's going to be another meeting on November 16th, so mark your calendars. Um, and yeah, don't forget to pick up the information outside on the table. Um, and you can tweet from the next event. You can also write to the governor or call. Um, the phone number is 603-271-7676. You can write to the PUC. Um, you can write LTE to your local paper. Um, and you could tweet at the governor using the hashtag, hashtag stop and H utility heights. Thank you. Thank you so much, Erica. And we'll, like Erica said, we will be following up after this meeting to all of our participants with some of the resources that we have collected that, they, that our panelists have shared with us, um, as well as um, more information, again, like she said, of the follow-up um, community meeting that we will have to continue this work together. So I just want to thank you all, all of you who joined us um, virtually, all of you who drove out here, spent your evening with us in person. We really do appreciate um, you connecting with us. It is so important that we stay connected because these issues only change uh, when we know about it and we know what to do about it. So many thanks to our panelists. Thank you for coming. If you haven't gotten any information, please grab some sheets before you go and have a wonderful evening and we will see you all soon.